Okay. Okay. So, I'm um, uh, Leona. So, Leona De Pasquale. I'm the uh, head of training for Wired, which is a London-based uh, wine training company and event company, and we are the sister company of uh, Jessica's Wine Merchant. And so we are really happy to see many of you today. Well, I'm expecting a lot more. Okay, so I'm pretty sure everyone will probably joining. I completely forgot today is a bank holiday in, in the UK, but hopefully it's not going to affect our attendance. And so we are happy to have Simon uh, here today with us. And he is the author of Amber Revelation, so which is the first uh, orange wine book in the world. And I happen to be the translator for the Chinese version, um, which is behind me, maybe you can see. And uh, so being a translator, so I've been uh, reading this book from the first letter to the last one. So I can assure you that's a really, really amazing and fascinating book that I really highly, highly recommend it. Okay, so, and, uh, uh, so before Simon takes over, Please just allow me to give you a little information about what we are going to do in the next few weeks. And for some of you who probably have joined us for a long time, you know, since the beginning of uh, May, that we have so many different uh, master classes. So today is the last one in May, and then uh, the next one is uh, coming next week, which is we have Monday the organic wine with uh, Breed and Per Carlson. And then on the 8th, we have Bordeaux wine, Australian wine follows. And then the last, our finale is a fine wine session. And so then for anyone who wants to join, here are some information very quickly. And so I can, I hope you can all see this. So basically, if you wanted to join any of our, you know, master classes in the future, the best way will be log on to our Instagram. Okay, so why at training? Or you want to get in touch, I'll give you some more information and our website is there. And um, enough from me. Okay, so and um, I think we'll have even more people later on. But uh, over to you, Simon. Thanks, Leona. And um, yeah, hello, everyone. Great to see so many of you. It's, it's always... It's always slightly strange doing these things online because you don't have such a good idea of who you're talking to, but I hope that I'll um, answer all of the questions that you might have and obviously then we can go over more questions at the end. So my aim is, is really to define orange wine and just tell you what it, what it is, or at least what I think it is, and also just talk a little bit about where this style came from um you know it's it's not just something new that appeared by magic a few years ago so i'll try and give you a bit of background um what's the history behind it how is it made where are the kind of hot spots where we see this style a lot and also um some some tips in terms of, of serving because i know that quite a, a few of you are from the on trade so that's what i'm going to try to cover i'll try to keep my bit to 20 minutes so that we have time to chat and have questions after. Um, let's see if I manage that or not. Um, now comes the exciting bit where I'm going to try to share my presentation. Um, so I think you can all see it. So yeah, Leona's has already very kindly pointed out um, I'm the author of this book, Amber Revolution. Um, and it's, it's worth a mention because if what I'm saying today piques your interest and you want to go a bit deeper into this fascinating topic, then um, yeah, please do buy my book and, and hopefully that will take you much, much deeper and in more detail about this. And yeah, and, and it's easy enough to find on Amazon or my website or lots of other places too. Um, okay, uh, so let's cut straight to the chase um, and so what is orange wine? So this is a term that confuses people. Um, a lot of people, I think, um, aren't really sure how to define it, even if they know that they like the wines. And there are obviously confusions with things like natural wine as well. So let's try and define this. And first of all, you need to know that there are lots of alternative names that people use and that's partly why this is so confusing some people say it's called amber wine some people talk about skin contact white wine skin fermented white wine and so on and so on so what are all these names and what do they mean so i have a very very simple way of defining orange wine um, and it is simply um, wine made from white grapes that have been fermented with the skins 
simple as that. Now, the reason that that's important and the reason that it's different is because obviously when you make um, a normal white wine, that you get rid of the skins very early on in the process. So for, for normal white wine making, um, this, you'll throw the skins away almost immediately that the grapes come into the winery. Whereas with orange wine, they stay in there during the fermentation for days, weeks, months. Um, let's just kind of dig into that a little bit more. And I like to use a diagram to explain this. Um, so first of all, let's just, let's just go back a bit to first principles. Now we're all familiar with this thing called red wine. And I think if I tell you that red wine is a wine made from red grapes where you ferment with the skins, you're all gonna be pretty comfortable with that. Um, the kind of opposite of that, if you like, is as, as I just said, white wine. So white wine is white grapes without the skins. Um, important thing that I want you to notice here is um, these terms that we use, red, white, and so on, they seem to suggest colours, but actually it's not really about colour, it's much more about the winemaking technique. So red wines aren't really red, you know, they're often purpley coloured or even a tawny shade. White wines certainly aren't white, you know, they're, they're yellow, green, gold, or many other shades. Um, Let's carry this on. Now, we talked about red wine, rosé wine, those same red grapes, but this time we don't use the skins. Now, I'm sure you can see where I'm going here. Uh, so far, we've got three possible combinations when you look at white or red grapes with or without the skins. So of course, what's the missing combination? It's white grapes with dead skins. Uh, and that's what I'm calling orange wine. And it's as simple as that. A lot of people get very hung up about the definition. They'll say things like, well, why, why do we call this wine orange when it's not orange? And again, I would say white wines aren't white. You know, white wines are not the white of a, of a graphic designer. Um, all of these terms are a kind of easy shorthand. And really, I hope you can see from this diagram, they define the winemaking technique more than anything else. So. We are talking about wine made from white grapes that has been fermented with the skins. Now, orange wine, white grapes fermented with the skins, is actually a very, very old and traditional way to process white grapes. And the reason for that is because if you don't have any technology, if you don't have a press and you don't have temperature controlled stainless steel tanks, then the easiest possible way that you can process white grapes is just to throw everything in some kind of vessel and let it ferment. And essentially you'll then end up with what we today call orange wine. So it's a very, very old and traditional way to make wine out of white grapes. And because of that, most of the winemakers who've rediscovered this style and, and gone back to, and gone back to it tend to want to respect that tradition and do things in a very traditional way. So there are a few other things that are worth bearing in mind here. Usually when people are making what we now call orange wine, they're usually doing it in a very hands-off way. And that means that they won't use temperature control during the fermentation. They want to extract the flavors and the aromas from the skins. So they don't want to chill down the fermentation too much. So you get that sort of very cold fermentation, kind of tropical fruit, banana aromas. Usually the vast majority of orange wines people are doing as spontaneous fermentations. So instead of adding a laboratory yeast, which is very common in a lot of mainstream winemaking, you just let the, the grapes ferment with the yeasts that are naturally on the skins. Uh, again, obviously that's very easy uh, when you've got the skins in the fermentation, it's, it's a bit harder uh, with white wine where you've already thrown the skins away by the time the fermentation is happening. The final thing that is worth bearing in mind that is really different about orange wine compared to white wine is that almost inevitably we're talking about wines that have gone through the malolactic fermentation. So that's the, the second fermentation where the, um, um, yeah, the, the, the kind of more aggressive uh, acids are, are turned into the, the softer lactic acids. Uh, so these are some things worth bearing in mind. Uh, orange wine per definition 
doesn't necessarily have to be made in this very minimal intervention kind of natural type of way but in most cases it is because the winemakers who are excited about this technique tend to be those winemakers who want to work in a low intervention traditional way so this is uh, this is the definition and notice that i don't think it's important to say how many days of skin contact there are or what color the resulting wine might be or even if it's cloudy or not for me none of these things is part of the definition of orange wine the only thing that matters is that the skins are in the fermentation and that's what makes the difference the reason that makes a difference of course is because you're getting all these flavor and aroma compounds that are on the skins but that with normal white wine you've thrown the skins away so those flavors simply aren't going to end up in the finished wine um, i said that this is a, a very old way to make wine and we have proof of this in many parts of the world the areas that have i think the longest tradition of treating white grapes in this fashion are first of all uh, northern italy so particularly the collio sub-region of friuli and its Slovenian twin, uh, Gershka Birda, which actually means the same as Collio, but in Slovene. Um, so this kind of whole area around the Adriatic Ocean, uh, Friuli, Slovenia, the top end of Croatia, is a real hot spot where there's a more or less unbroken tradition of making what these days we would call orange wine. It all went a bit underground and became very unfashionable for a while but this is still an area that's very culturally rich in orange wine culture. And we do have proof of this and I'll share that with you in a second. Uh, a couple of other areas that are worth mentioning. Um, Alentejo in the south of Portugal also has a, a tradition of making wines in Amphora that we can trace at least as far back as the Roman era. And the interesting thing is that although today Alentejo is considered to be more of a red wine region in fact in the past white wines were always more popular and those white wines were fermented in amphoras with the skins so by our modern definition they are definitely orange wine and there's been a bit of a resurgence of this style of wine making in Alentejo, which i'll talk about a bit more later most important of all is the republic of georgia it's sometimes called the cradle of wine this is where we have evidence going back further than anywhere else in terms of being able to prove that wine was made, stored, enjoyed, certainly at least 5,000 years ago, maybe as long as 8,000 years ago. So there are archaeological digs where we've discovered shards of quebries, that's the Georgian type of amphora, with great pip residue on them. We can be pretty sure that wine was being fermented in amphoras thousands upon thousands of years ago. And Georgia to this day has preserved this culture of making what they prefer to call amber wines. Um, and again, with amber wines, everything goes into the, the quevery, the amphora, um, grape pulp, skins, stems sometimes as well. And you get this deeply amber, often quite savory flavored wine that, that comes out. So the culture of skin fermented wine is I think strongest in these parts of the world, at least historically and culturally. Obviously it's spread all over the globe now, but these are the areas that are maybe particularly interesting from a historical point of view. Um, I did mention um, that we know that this has always been a very important style in Northern Italy and Slovenia. And one of the reasons we know that it is because of the existence of this marvelous book called Winemaking for Slovenians or Vinirea na Slovenska, if you can speak an old Slovene dialect. And this was a book written by a Slovene priest in 1844, where he talks about how important it is to ferment your white grapes with the skins if you want to end up with a wine that is stable, has a reliable fermentation to dryness, and also just tastes better. In fact, he even went a bit further than that. He even said that if you use the skins, you'll end up with a wine that is better for your health. So there you go. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm trying to read a, a question at the same time, but we'll come to that later, I'm sure. So we know that um, 
in large parts of Central Europe um, that the tradition for using white grapes was always to ferment them with the skins. And in fact, there are, there are lots of other interesting historical books that I dug up when I was researching my book. Uh, and they, they single out specific areas, some parts of Austria, parts of Slovenia, Croatia, all over the place, you find evidence that these were white wines that were made much more as if they were red wines. So very old tradition. It's, it's obviously it's something that's often talked about as if it's kind of hip, fashionable, but orange wine wasn't invented by sommeliers in New York 10 years ago. It's the oldest tradition we have in terms of winemaking in many ways. Something I'd like to reflect on is how fast things can happen in wine or you know how easily we can forget things and how they get rediscovered again. So what we call orange wine these days and, and the name orange wine is a bit more recent um, had pretty much died out on a commercial basis by the 1960s, 1970s, winemaking technology had come along and the fashion was very much to make these kind of very pure star bright white wines. You know, that was something that became easy to do with the advent of things like laboratory yeasts, uh, sulfur dioxide in tablet form, temperature control, stainless steel tanks. They made it easy to make this kind of modern style of white wine that has now become the norm. And so with that, the idea that you might have a, a darker colored wine made from white grapes, and especially that it might have slightly less familiar flavors or aromas, that really went out the window. So where that got us to is, let's say 1990, if we take that as a benchmark, so it's only, it's only 30 years ago, um, you couldn't have found anything in a bottle which we would classify as orange wine these days. It just, it just didn't exist as a commercial style. And by commercial, all I mean is that you could go to a, a wine shop or a, a restaurant and buy it. And then thanks to some of the gentlemen in this picture, really, thanks to uh, particularly Joschko Gradner, who you see in the center of this picture, and Stanko Radikon, um, just to the left of him. You know, they started getting interested in what their grandfathers had done, how they'd made wine, and maybe if that could help them make wines from the Collio, with more authenticity. And it was really uh, thanks to their efforts, I think, that the world slowly started to rediscover this style again. So in the, in the mid 90s, Gardner and Radicon kind of were getting a bit restless. They were, they were starting to realize that technology and maybe French traditions of making wine weren't the only game in town. Maybe, maybe that for their region, for their part of Europe, that another method was gonna help them express what they had in their vineyards a little bit better. So they started experimenting with skin fermentation, particularly with the grape variety Ribola Jala uh, in, the, in the kind of mid 90s. Um, in the year 2000, Gravner finally got the chance to go to the Republic of Georgia. He'd read about this old tradition of making the wines in the Quevries, but uh, obviously Georgia after independence in, in the 90s was a, a dangerous place to visit. They had a civil war. 2000 he finally got the chance to go he was absolutely amazed he managed to find a cellar where they were still making quevery wines and he immediately decided that these these very georgian amphoras were the perfect vessel and he ordered a bunch of them to make wine back home in italy um, so not only did he kind of help promote this old idea of, of skin fermented white wine, but he also in many ways opened the door on Georgian wine culture and got loads of other people excited about Georgia as a winemaking country. Mid 2000s, you really started to see a bit of a renaissance in this style. So Gravner and Radicon were maybe some of the first who bottled this style of wine and actually put it on the market uh, and really actually put it on the market and say, you know, hey guys, this is, this is us, this is uh, the purest expression of our region, and this is a fine wine. And lots of their colleagues followed suit. And certainly by the mid 2000s, you had winemakers all over Italy who were getting excited about skin fermented white wines, also getting excited about amphoras, getting excited about Georgia. So you had people like Elisabetta Foradori in Alto Adige, or Kos in Sicily, also Frank Cornelison, and the names go on and on. So it, it really started catching on that there are other ways that you can treat white grapes 
and you don't just have to make fresh white wines or French style Burgundian wines. Um, around about 2010, we had a kind of renewal of interest in, in the similar style in Alentejo as well. Sorry, which I just noticed I've spelt wrong on this slide. Apologies, Alentejo should be with a, a J, not with a G. So in Alentejo, the idea. to from this is that today so 30 years on from my arbitrary date of 1990 there are way more than a thousand producers worldwide probably into the multiple thousands actually who produce what we would now call orange wine uh, so this has been a little bit of a revolution you know we've gone from a point where the entire wine industry the entire wine world thought that with white grapes you should just throw the skins away and not use them and now in 2020 we're at the point where many artisanal winemakers in all parts of the globe think that's a ridiculous idea you know why wouldn't you use the skins of white grapes if the skins of red grapes have flavor in them then surely the skins of white grapes do too which of course is, is right just to sort of put this all into perspective i i'm i did some back of an envelope calculations based on all the wine producers I know. And these are four countries which I think today are at the forefront of orange wine production. So Slovenia, Austria, Georgia, Italy. And I, I kind of charted how many producers were making orange wine on a Hello everyone, can you hear me? Because I, I think that a lot of us, we can't hear Simon, but can you, can anyone hear me at least? Right, okay. So Simon, let me, let me find out what's happening. Uh, give me one second. Right. Sorry, guys. I, 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 <laughs> my connection seems to have become unstable. Very bad timing. Um, but I'm back, I think. Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, apologies for that. Uh, I'm not quite sure at what point uh, you all lost me, but I'll, I'll maybe just uh, backtrack a little. Um, we roughly two so... minutes. <laughs> uh, and the, 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 Sorry? The graph when you are explaining the four different countries. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, now my presentation has also fallen out of its hang on. Um, okay, so sorry. You, you all hear me? You hear me, Leona? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, yes, so I was just talking about the, the growth in the number of winemakers who who are making orange wine on a on a commercial basis, um, and the growth has been really swift. Uh, and I think it's important to note that winemakers, as much as anyone else, have been responsible for this growth. So winemakers often get excited 
about this possibility because if you if you spend your whole year um, working on a vineyard and growing white grapes, it, it you kind of it seems kind of odd when you get these grapes into the winery and then you think, okay, I'm just going to throw the skins away. I mean, that could be ten ten percent, fifteen percent of of the grape, and you're just throwing it away almost immediately. So I think a lot of winemakers, particularly those who are farming organically or biodynamically, particularly those who are maybe really more obsessed about their vineyard health and quality uh, it's the natural thing is to use everything is to use use the whole grape really to use the skins as well and that's partly why this style has become so popular in comparison to just a couple of decades ago um okay so i can see that unfortunately because i lost my connection there I'm running out of time um just a quick recap so why would you want to make an orange wine? You know, why would you want to make use the skins at all? And there are a few very good reasons that if your wine maker makes this attractive. And the first is if you want to work natural way without added yeast, if you want to work with the minimum possible intervention, it's much easier with white grapes if you include the skins because the skins have most of the um, have most of the, the wild yeasts on them. Um, secondly. Again, if you want to make a wine without filtering, if you want to make a wine with the minimum possible amount of added sulfites, the tannins that you get from skin fermentation actually give strength and stability to the wine because tannins actually act as an antioxidant. So you actually get a kind of natural protection for the wine if you use the skins. Um, I think the third thing to say is that, as I mentioned before, the skins have all kinds of flavors and aromas in them that you miss out on if you don't use them. And so this is another key reason to make orange wine, to, to get 100% of the flavors and aromas that the grape offers you. Um, misconceptions. Some people get confused between orange wines and natural wines. So natural wine just describes the philosophy. Uh, it's overarching. It can be any style of wine. Orange wine, as I've explained, is just a technique. So they're not the same thing. Um, some people think that orange wines are oxidized because of the color. This is not true. So orange wines get their color due to the pigmentation of the skins, nothing else. It's not the intention of these winemakers to produce an oxidized style. It's not like Van Jun or Sherry or things like that. And some people think that all orange wines have to be made in an amphora, which is also not true. Um, so I just wanted to clear up those misconceptions. Um, just a little about, bit about serving. So orange wines do kind of sit in the middle of white and red. Um, they often have the freshness of white wines, but you have structure and you have texture. To get the most out of them, generally you want to serve them a little bit warmer. So I would, I would usually maybe start around 12 Celsius um, and then maybe even warm them up a bit more than that, depending on the style. I mean, orange wines can span the entire gamut. They can be very light and floral, or they can be heavier and quite tannic. So it slightly depends on what style of orange wine that you have in your glass, but always a little bit warmer than whites if you want to get the best out of them. What I really like about them is that they are superb food matching wines because you have this structural component and you often have some tannin so they'll they'll do very well with fatty pork dishes or cheese or chicken umami flavors seems to be a match made in heaven and i think this may be one reason why orange wines have become so popular in japan um, they also go very well with maybe foods that are traditionally seen as a bit difficult to food match with so fermented foods um, a lot of nordic cuisine and asian cuisine spicy foods very spicy foods that would be difficult to pair with. Sometimes orange wines, particularly those made from aromatic varieties, can really work a treat. So there's super versatile wines and often in, I, if I don't know exactly what's going to be on the table, I know if I've got an orange wine on standby, I'll probably do fine. I think as always, you need to know what kind of orange wine you're dealing with. So the grape variety will make a difference. Uh, whether the wine has been like, aged in oak will make a difference. The alcohol level, you know, these are all clues in terms of the food matching, but here I'm probably, I'm not telling you anything that's specific to orange wine. These are just general things that will help with food matching. But super versatile wines, that's the, uh, that's the main message really. 
orange wine isn't defined officially in most parts of the world. So most parts of the world, it's kind of outside the law, really. It falls through the cracks. And that's why a lot of winemakers aren't able to write orange wine or amber wine or anything like that on the, on the label. There are a couple of places in the world that have defined it now. So in South Africa, they introduced a definition of orange wine in 2015. It's called skin fermented white, officially. In Ontario, Canada, they also have a definition now from as of 2017. And Austria also actually has a legal definition. In Austria, it's a little bit confusing because they muddle it up with natural wine. But these are the only parts of the world where there is anything like uh, a legal definition. And so they're also the only parts of the world where you can actually write orange wine on the label without any issue. In most traditional wine producing countries, um, France, Italy, Spain, and so on, especially if you're in a, a, in a, a an Appalachian controlled area, often you, you have to put white wine, however much you know that it's not a white wine. So this is a problem. I think this, this doesn't help with confusion, but this is where we are at the moment. So I hope that we'll see more legislation uh, that will allow people to differentiate because to me it's important, you know, orange wines are not the same as white wines. So I think it's important to be able to make that clear to the consumer. Um, the other point I wanted to say, I think uh, Leona was asking me if I could say something about how you list these wines on a wine list. And again, for wine lists, I would say if you have a number of different orange wines on your list, then please find a way to put them in their own section and make it clear to the customer. Because if someone orders an orange wine, thinking it's a white wine um, and there isn't a sommelier on hand to guide them, then they're, they're at best going to be surprised, maybe in a good way, but at worst, they're going to be disappointed. You know, of course, if you thought you were ordering a kind of fresh Sancerre style wine and you end up with Radicon, um, it might not be what you want. So I do think it is important to signpost these wines. I do think it's important that they are in their own category. Um, this is pretty much everything I wanted to say before we get on to questions, I think. Um, so, I'm sorry, I also... I, I um, yes, so there are a few questions now. I uh, just need to scroll back a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then a few more to my private one. So from Vicky, uh, so she's asking, are there a lot of wines named orange wine, which are actually not? And where is the overlap between the definition and the practice? Thank you. Um, okay, I'm not. I'm not quite sure where you're going with this this question. I mean, if 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 we accept that orange wines are any wine made from white grapes that have been fermented with their skins, then I think most often when people write orange wine on the label, then that's that's what it is. The exceptions would be the wines from the orange region of New South Wales in Australia. Um, this is a, a thorn in the side <laughs> because it, it does create problems with the term orange wine. Um, the orange wine region in New South Wales isn't especially well known, but I, I know that they, they hate the fact that the rest of the world talks about skin fermented whites as orange wines because it's confusing. So that could be one possible confusion, I think. Um, there are a couple of parts of the world where people genuinely make wine from fermented oranges um, in the US and in Spain are the two that I know about. So this can create confusion. It's also the reason why I found out very recently that if you're importing wine to the US, you can't have orange wine written on the label. So the US doesn't allow the term orange wine at all because they say it's too confusing and people will think it's made of oranges. Uh, my personal response to that would be, well, the people think that rosé wine is made from roses. Uh, so just on this note, so someone's saying, do you like the term orange wine? Wouldn't amber wine be better? Um, I, to be honest, I like to make life easy. Um, I see that around the world, orange wine is the most popular term. Orange wine is the term that I see cropping up most often restaurants using it, winemakers using it, whoever. So I tend to use this term merely because it's the most common. I also think that it fits with our paradigm of using fairly primary colours. And if we talk about red, white and rosé wine, orange fits quite nicely in there. Amber, it's a bit more esoteric. 
Um, amber also, there, there is a Van Ambre, um, it's, a, it's an old style uh, from the Southern Rome, Rome. So there would be confusion with amber wine. Georgians prefer the term amber wine, um, so they tend to talk about amber wine, but yeah, I'm, to me this, it's, this is semantics, I don't think it's hugely important. Okay, if some people pre prefer amber, no problem. I personally think orange is a simpler, less esoteric term to use. Um, also happens to be the same in three languages, it's the same word in French, German and English, which makes life easy. So if you tell if you tell German people about amber, you know a lot of them will struggle and have to figure out how you translate that. So I don't necessarily think that the term amber wine is, is better enough. There's another question earlier is uh, from Anthony. Uh, does orange wine get better with age? So I'd say a lot of orange wines do. Yeah, I mean if we consider these are you know these are wines where there's been extraction of of tannins from the skin. So they are wines that have a lot more texture and structure than most white wines would have. Um, and that often means that they're wines that are gonna age well or even demand for age. I mean, Gravner and Radicom, so the, the first two people who really pushed this, this style from the Collio, they are typically releasing their orange wines when they're six or seven years old. And I think that's a nice time to be drinking them. Obviously a lot of smaller producers, a lot of small winemakers maybe are driven by economic factors more than anything else. And that will determine when you release your wine. But I would say the vast majority of orange wines that will certainly taste better after two or three years in the bottle. Um, and in many cases, often after five or 10. Um, I see someone's asking what's the oldest orange wine I've ever had. Um, I've certainly had vintages of Grave now that have been 20 years old. Uh, even a bit more actually 1997 so yeah that's 23 years isn't it and yeah it was it was fantastic really so I think a, a lot of these wines for people who have the patience uh, they age very well I mean you have acidity and you have tannins those are the the two key things that I think can often help wines age there's one uh, just come up from Chris are any orange wine producers or regions experimenting uh, with carb carbonic maceration or dry apostamental fermentation methods? Yeah, I've, I've, I've certainly seen both. I mean, I think not carbonic maceration per se. I mean, uh, to be honest, 100% carbonic maceration is very, very rare. You know, even in Beaujolais, most people are not doing that. They're doing what we call semi-carbonic. They're basically doing a whole bunch fermentation where you get a little bit of the, the carbonic effect as the grapes get crushed gradually. Um, whole bunch however is very popular. Uh, so whole bunch fermentation obviously you keep the skins in there but your extraction is a bit more gentle than if you already crushed everything and you're doing lots of punch downs. So a whole bunch where you get a kind of semi-carbonic effect I see as a, as a very, very popular method in orange wine making, especially actually in the new world. I know a lot of producers in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, who like to do it this way, because they're often aiming to make orange wines which are a bit more fruit forward, uh, a bit less tannins perhaps than some of the more traditional styles that you find in Italy or Slovenia. And uh, so Veronica is asking, can you age all or most natural wines? I'd say so, yeah. I, I mean, it depends what you mean by age, really. I think some, there are some wines that are just fun to drink young and don't really need to be aged, but I would say 99% of all wines, in my opinion, it's nicer when it's had at least a year or two of extra bottle age. I think most white wines and orange wines tend to become more harmonious and tend to flesh out. Beyond that, I think it's down to personal taste, really. Do you, if, do you like drinking a mature wine or do you like drinking young wine? They're, they're different animals. They, they both have something to recommend them, um, but it's personal taste. And the other question here from Ruth, what happens to flavor as they age, as they start off quite savory in many cases? Um, I, th I think the important thing and the reason why people like Gravner release their wines so old 
is that you get a softening of the structure and the tannins. So if you, if you did quite a lot of extraction, if you have a lot of tannins in your wine, then they're going to integrate better. They're going to soften and you're going to end up with a wine that's a bit gentler on the palate and, and maybe a bit more harmonious. So I think that's probably one of the most important things that happens through age. I mean, of course, it's, it's like any wine, you know, you'll get more tertiary flavors, more dried herb and wood smoke and things like this and, and less of the primary fruit as time goes on. But I think it, it takes a long time before wines really turn the corner. I mean, certainly, yeah, I think five or 10 years, you can still have wines where you, you still have lots of fruit and freshness, but it depends on the wine. It's, it's case by case. Yeah, I think we have just one, uh, two last questions. That's, uh, I think you touched upon this question already a little bit in the beginning. Can we say that orange wine equals uh, organic wine? Uh, no, absolutely not. I mean, as I said, my definition of orange wine is purely technical. It's, it's a wine made from white grapes where you fermented the skins. There's a big overlap because most winemakers who are willed to make orange wine tend to be those who are, you know, interested in more traditional or sustainable types of winemaking. They tend to be those winemakers who are, will, will be farming organically biodynamically anyway but it's not always the case so no, there are orange wines out there that haven't been made from organically grown fruit yeah and in, in simon's book there's a good chapter about tips really recommended last question in your opinion what or will orange wine ever make it to the mainstream uh, it depends how you define the mainstream really i mean i think it's already it's already carved out a niche um, it's not it's not going away it's people used to talk about it as a trend that might be dead by next year and you know it's I think orange wine is a niche in the same way that um, sherry is a niche in the same way that sweet wines are a niche in the same way that you know name your own niche style so that's the thing wine is full of styles which don't trouble the supermarket styles full of styles which most ordinary wine consumers haven't heard of but that doesn't mean that these styles aren't important and that they don't have a future so not everything has to be made by the millions of bottles and sold in a supermarket and there's enough there's, there's enough room in the wine world for niche styles like this okay i think that's the last question ashley so and uh yes yeah, so thank you so much and thank you everyone i think a lot a few people actually had trouble logging in i've got a few emails but uh, it, it's, yeah. there's no problem because we i'm going to send uh you know the uh, recording to everyone and if you wanted to share and uh, or you know reply that would be no problem and i think it's sunny outside in the uk and there's quite a few people of you are in, in the uk so enjoy this <laughs> afternoon and thank you simon and probably enjoy with the glass of orange wine <laughs> okay yeah, absolutely yeah <laughs> okay thank thanks everyone okay thank you and have a lovely afternoon thanks okay bye uh, bye